components of physical literacy and one of them is that children who have it should move with poise. Now that's actually quite easy to say and do you think you would recognize it if you saw it? Yeah, it's tough to describe but we'd know what it is. We'd also want them to move with economy. We don't want them to do a lot of wasteful movements and we want them to move with confidence and those would be three things and if you saw somebody moving economically with poise and confidence that'd be pretty good wouldn't it? Yeah, so we'd be good there but we want them to be able to do this in a wide range of physically challenging situations. We also want them to be able to read the situation and I can't even say this without laughing. I went to Manitoba just before Christmas to do a similar workshop and I thought I was working with a group of students. That's what I've been asked to do. And I, I'm a prof so what if I thought I was going to do was go and work with a group of university students. Well it turns out they were 10 year old elite hockey players which was a little bit of a surprise to me. Um, but I got to the gym early and two young children were in the gym and it was like watching a train wreck. They were coming towards each other and it was absolutely clear to me that neither of them had a clue where the other one was. And two people in a full gym space managed to collide. Okay? And I would say that's because they lack some physical literacy components which is an ability to read the situation, to see what's going on around you and if you read it, anticipate what is going to happen next. If you're running this way and I'm running this way, we might want to anticipate that sooner or later those two things would collide. And then of course to respond appropriately, you see what's happening, you predict what's going to happen next, you respond appropriately. And again, I want people to be able to do this in different environments. In the water, on the field, in the gym, because we're in Canada, on snow and ice, not just only in one place. Kids who are physically literate have the ability and motivation to use their movement potential. Those people in sport in this room, how many times have you seen somebody with tremendous skill and absolutely no motivation to use it? Okay, doesn't it burn you up? Okay, but we want them to use the skills they have. And we want this to be done based on local culture and their personal ability. If you're in a wheelchair and you are severely uh, CP, then this is going to mean something very different to somebody who is an able-bodied person. But we still want them to go as far as they can. It also needs to be based on a local culture. If a 10-year-old boy arrived tomorrow in Saskatoon from Southeast Asia, what skill would make him immediately part of the local boys community and be integrated if he could do it and which skill if he can't do it will have him on the outside for a considerable amount of time in this town? What would you need to be able to do? Skate. If you're a 10 year old who can come in and you can skate then you will be immediately in that group. If you come in and you can't, and that's why the local culture is so important. If you can do everything we've shown so far, you're probably going to have a well-established sense of your body, a, a good sense of the physical self, and that should lead to self-esteem and self-confidence. I want to take a little bit of a time out because I am really concerned about uh, how we are going with this whole concept of self-esteem and self-confidence. My belief, and that's all it is, my belief is that genuine self-confidence and self-esteem comes from being able to do something that you couldn't previously do. So when we tell everybody, that was a good job, great, you're doing great, every time, whether it's good, bad or indifferent, I think we're actually creating an artificial self-esteem which gets destroyed quite quickly and easily. 
kids have been shown to have a remarkable ability to judge how well they do things compared to other people. And they know we are lying through our teeth when we tell them it was great and they know it is not. So I'm talking about genuine self-esteem, genuine self-confidence because you've learned to do things you couldn't previously do. And if you've got all of that, then you are going to have physical literacy. And that's pretty much a kind of a visual based on all of the academic definitions. When does it need to be achieved? By the start of the adolescent growth spurt? Um, this is the graph of growth. Kids grow a great deal in the first year of life. Most of you could actually draw this graph for your children. Go to your kitchen, find that door frame, <laughs> the one that's got the little marks for how tall they were each year. And this graph is how much they grew since last year. Okay? So, they grew a lot in the first, second, third year. During this latter part of childhood, it's very consistent growth. That's why it's so good at learning skills, because the body is changing nice and consistently all the way through. And then we go through the adolescent growth spurt, and you can track it, and you can actually see when it happens by measuring kids, but there's actually a shortcut. Those of you who want to know when kids are going, starting this adolescent growth spurt, look at their shoes. You're going to get to a point where the kid grows out of the pair of shoes in two to three months. They're just not big enough and that actually occurs pretty much at this point here on the, uh, on the growth chart. And it's actually a very good marker. During this time we want enjoyment of activity, habits of activity, activity, and what I'm going to spend uh, some considerable time on is building brain connections.